This was a show that was done, it was called Nerves of a Poor, November 2013, I believe. And I'm afraid of what I might say because it might sound like how I feel. Mm. That, that someone has jammed a metal pin against that open nerve of that exposed cavity in my rat-like teeth. What does it feel like to read a soul? Mm. A soul like mine? I don't know. But let me brace you. Mm. Rehashing this, revealing this, it just might hurt. What hurt? Yeah. I love the word soul. It's not often used. You know, so vulnerable. Exactly. This is a haiku called Bruised. I think we all feel bruised deep down, but don't think of it until times like these. This is a bomb story. It's called 8 to 16. You came back again from one of your trips to the other side of the planet. You know I love you more than anything on Earth, but I'm getting used to your absence. It's a terrible thing to say, I know, but when you came back this time, you sa and said you had a fever. I, I figured you just ingested some toxic water and you'd have a stomach flu for days, but that you'd be fine. But this time, yeah. with your fever, I remembered how you drank the water swimming south of the equator, and I thought nothing of it. It would just clear up in a week, and I'll just hold up on kissing you again. But after eight days, you went to the doctor, told them your, your travel and ails. That's when the doctor called the CDC, and the federal agencies swarmed in. Mm -hmm. After you left for the doctor, the next contact I had was with men in hazmat suits at my door. Mm. They asked if I was alone. They asked if I had any children. They asked me if I would come with them. I, I told them I needed to wait for my husband, and they told me that you were now in isolation. After hours, they told me that you caught a nasty virus while you were away on your trip. When I said, oh, wait a minute, he asked me he was on a work trip, and his company made him take a ton of drugs so that he'd be immune, and then they actually catch a thing, and that's when they stopped me, right there. They locked me in a room. They told me I couldn't leave. Then they said he caught a bad strain while helping a woman he found on the street, bleeding, pregnant, and in pain. It took them two days to discover the details before they gave me the news. He's in isolation. We're, we're trying new treatments, and hopefully he'll be okay. <laughs> But I, I know this virus, it's usually lethal, so, so, so please, let me see him, now. That's when I said, sorry, it's out of our hands, but you must be quarantined too. So I screamed at the medics, all to no avail, as they swore I had to stay safe. So, I paced in my isolation. I watched the drive-by news and I heard them say stats that death from this virus can come from 8 up to 16 days. 8 to 16 days. It was 8 days before he even went to the doctor. Was this waiting to, going to actually do him in? I, I couldn't talk to him. I, I couldn't see his face. I couldn't kiss him or tell him I loved him. That's all I was able to do. That, that I'll always love him. That, that I'm nothing without him. The morning of the fifth day, still trapped in isolation, that's when they told me he died. 
my, my blood work was clean, but they kept me in isolation when they said they cremate my blood. And all I could think was, after you're done, send to Arlington National Cemetery so the world would know he's a hero to more than just me, as you kept me away till he died. And still, I continue to pace, trapped in this room, alone, with nothing to wait for, ever again. No. Obviously, it's not about me. I said that's a story. <laughs> no, no, that didn't happen. But he, she, my, my husband, actually, literally could be very Marilyn. Well, he'd be cremated. <laughs> he'd be cremated. Yeah, he'd have to die first. But that, I'm not going for that. Um, no, no. So that's a true story from someone else? I believe so. And it was, yeah, it wasn't, no, I'm going to say it wasn't me. Um, I don't know if I should give you the one that we've got time, I'll do one about it. This one's called Lord Have Mercy. Mm -hmm. Looked into the coffin of a man who was once great. A at least that's what I hear. But the cancer ravaged him until his bones crumbled to dust. The, the family then wondered how the people at the funeral home could make him look like him. Mm -hmm. As his family walked into that room, they held their breath for more reasons than death, more reasons than their last viewing of the last viewing of the man they lost, now once again with meat on his bones. When the services started, we all had to follow the reverend's laments by all periodically proclaiming, Lord have mercy. The man with the collar would talk and I would wonder what it would be like to hold the job of applying the makeup to the dead, to try to make them look not so dead. Pull up the cheeks, apply face paint to give them color. Lord have mercy. Beforehand, a string of older firemen came up to us before the coffin with small black bands over each of their badges. When a fire station, when the fire station started, before the town even had a fire station, he yeah, used a red truck with ladders tacked to the sides and a trailer to haul barrel of water. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. The man with the collar started a hymn. Everyone in the small town knew the lines and sang along like little lemmings. And I tried to remember the lines from my childhood that I have no reason to say except when people need something, anything, to make them think life doesn't have to end. Lord, have mercy. The man with the collar reminded the room that people were created for life, that death was not a part of the plan, but stifle the overwhelming desire to caress the one you loved, now in a coffin, for the coldness would be too stark of a reminder. Lord, have mercy. Wanted to try to look into the coffin from a different angle. Maybe then the deceased would not, would seem more real. Maybe then I wouldn't see his lack of hair from the chemo gone wrong. Maybe then I wouldn't see his hands clasping rosary beads. Lord, have mercy. I remember the string of people waiting to meet us before they proceeded to the coffin, which reminded me of the procession of people waiting to congratulate a bride and groom immediately after the wedding ceremony. But in this macabre receiving line, all the funeral attendants were repeatedly saying to us, I'm sorry for your loss. And I wonder how many times a man in the coffin had to say those words in his lifetime of service. How hollow those words were once he spoke them. When the words then seemed so stifling. And I think how people say this when nothing can express how anyone is feeling. Especially when people don't know how to feel anymore. Lord have mercy. 
The chants is now ended. The Knights of Columbus stop their constant repeated prayers for the painted man in the coffin to help justify the pain we don't know how to deal with. Lord, have mercy. It was all I could think. Not to call a higher power, but to give empty words at an empty time with too many injustices in this living death scene. We're all players in this charade, making up death in a way in which we want to believe it's not ghoulish. That's what we keep telling ourselves, unless we choose to ignore the cop while unsettled lives are still around us. We mourn, or cry, and we try to fit the pieces into what we call life. And for those who believe, and even for those who don't, you seem to be the only fitting words to think or feel. Lord. I've got just a few on this page as I've moved it up a little bit more. This one's called Violent Affair. How one-sided is a violent, passionate sexual affair? Is it a small metal boat tied with a long rope to the dock, living to react with the tide, trapped there, pounding against the ocean alone? Then, with the tide, rushing in, seeping out, rhythmically, waiting for the tide to rush in again to the shore, save for that rope pulling it back, and then being taken away again to do it all over again, spending its time held back and waiting, then almost being turned upside down by the rush, then recovering and waiting for it to all happen again. In other features, other people read these haikus. This one is called Fog. Fog envelops me. It's a thick, powerful force that doesn't let go. This one, which kind of relates to Violent Affair, I guess, is called Pant. Waves are crashing, and the moon's phases are changing to a rhythmic pant. I will close with one I don't know if you've heard before. Translation, 2014 IQ. This was only a translation for Trump. And I don't have the words. Uh, <laughs>